Good morning. My name is Shirley, and I am so honored to be up here this morning and to be able to worship with you today. Um, our pastors, all three of the Smiths, Tony, Ruth, Wes, Richard, are all on a confirmation retreat uh, with our young people, so I invite you to pray for them as they are all making decisions about their spiritual walk. It's such an important time in their lives, and we are so thankful that all of our pastors were able to go and spend this weekend with them. And we are happy to still be here to worship. We have Pastor Reverend um, Catherine Sherrill with us, who has become part of our church family during the week even. And so we are thankful for her, and thank you for her being able to give us the word. I do have one announcement this morning, and that is about lilies. Um, the, United Women of Faith are selling lilies for Easter morning. Um, the more, the more visual the joy is on Easter morning. So I just want to invite you that if you're interested in getting a lily, the ushers have forms for you to fill out. Or you can do that on Realm. If you don't know how to do Realm and get on there, call, call the church office. And they would be happy to help you figure that out. It'll be, a, it'll be no problem at all. So with all of that being said, that was a lot. Sorry. Take a deep breath in. Exhale all of those troubles and worries and center yourself for worship this morning. Each week of this Lent season, we are focusing on ways that we can practice a counterculture theology that emphasizes the beauty and grace of the reality of right now rather than waiting for the increasing judgment to reach some vision of a perfect existence. Our latter coming effort climbing efforts sometimes end up taking us down a wrong or two. So sometimes things just don't work out the way we want them to. And so let us continue to turn to the ladder into gardens, nourishing our soul and embracing our holy, good enough lives. pray together. Holy One, God of forgiveness, we call out to you and you surround us with deliverance. You love us intimately more than we love ourselves or others. Open us this day to your counsel, helping us to be more merciful, more grace-filled, so that we might rejoice in simple and good enough moments that fill our lives. Amen. We're going to have a video this morning um, by the children who are going to teach us. Good morning. It's great to see you again at our ladder garden. What did you bring me today? Um, well, it seems I lost an O. 
I was trying to fix it before church started, but I'm having an epic fail. We can help. Children, can you help look for where it might have fallen? Oh, thank you so much. I was, I hate making mistakes, and I just felt so embarrassed that this wasn't fixed perfectly before church started. I'll nail it off right now. discovering and creating things we never expected. One of, One of my favorite books is called Beautiful Oops. God doesn't expect us to never make mistakes or that we will always do everything perfectly. And when we do make some mistakes, we can sometimes learn new things because we did. So let's pray a repeat after me prayer. I, I look at you. you. I look at, I me. Look at me. I celebrate. What? what I see, because God made all, the smooth and rough, no matter what, you're good enough. Good morning, it's great to see you. Let us stand and sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed.
Today, we will hear how the prodigal son, who lived high on the hog and then phantom struck the land, messed up his dream vacation. And so he headed home, tail between his legs, expecting that he has lost it all. To his surprise, his extravagant failure is met with extravagant love and grace. We can be pretty hard on ourselves when things don't go as planned. Guilt, shame, fear of being seen as a failure can leave us waddling in the pig pen. Our delusions of a perfect life keeps us disappointed in ourselves. Truth is, life is one big old risk every single day. And facing whatever day holds, every, whatever each day holds, is not only good enough, but worthy of love and grace. Do you find yourself being unrealistic, hard on yourself? Take a minute now and reflect. Hear this compassionate word from the second letter of the Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Know that already God is offering us freedom from guilt and shame of our past failings and our present unrealistic expectations. We are invited to rejoice that each day, each day is a new beginning so that we might enjoy and not dread the life before us. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps, In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. I I invite you to stand and greet your neighbors as you are able or as, as you are comfortable. Oh, we have a scripture reading. You ready? Oh. I almost forgot the choir. (laughs) Sorry, choir. (laughs) Let us prepare ourselves to hear the music of the chancel choir.
bit short. <laughs> All right, the second reading today is 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the word to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We invite the children to go with Miss Joy. Oh, no. <laughs> to go. <laughs> Ages three, three through the first grade. And let us stand to sing, Change My Heart, Oh God. <clears throat> copy of this in the mail unexpectedly. So we can thank the Duke Endowment for believing that all the pastors should read this. <laughs> and when I looked at this cover and I started to read, I was immediately transported back to my graduate program in counseling. Because the phrase good enough actually comes straight from psychologist D.W. Winnicott. He worked with children and their parents in the 60s. And he actually coined the phrase in psychology, good enough. And he used this to describe what we could hope for in parenting, that we aren't perfect, but we are good enough. We create a holding space for children to be able to explore, to learn, to have a safe place. But it admits that parents will at some point not perfectly meet the needs of their children. This was revolutionary in the field of psychology we like to blame a lot on parenting and dw winnicott said well maybe children need to fail so that they can learn resiliency and have a secure environment 
Jokingly, after we studied this in grad school, we started to talk about what was the good enough paper, which was one you did not stay up writing until 3 a.m. Or the good enough dinner, which was a healthy selection of frozen chicken tenders straight to the oven. Just that little bit of grace. In a high stress environment like academics, it was a life preserver. And when I started journaling about good enough, I actually thought about our scripture reading, which is the prodigal son. This is from Luke chapter 15, beginning with the 11th verse. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then his father divided his estate between Soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a faraway land. There, he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he used up all his resources, a severe food shortage arose in the country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. <coughs> he longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I am starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting. Because the son was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard the music and the dancing. He called to one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. The older son was furious and didn't want to enter in, but his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, Look, I've served you all these years. I've never disobeyed your instructions, yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fat calf for him. Then his father said, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God that is still speaking. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. There are three main characters in our story, and usually we focus on the youngest. The story is, after all, called the prodigal son. But each character is so complex, and honestly, when I read this story, my attention is usually drawn to the older brother. The older brother has always done what's right. He stayed with his father, he worked hard, he never asked for much. He believed that he was doing absolutely everything the father wanted. In many ways, the older brother is trapped in perfection. When he learns his wayward brother will be celebrated, he quickly responds in anger. He says, basically, I've done everything for you, and you've given me nothing. He blames his father. He blames his brother. He takes a lot of his attitude and just becomes enraged. This is something that we're all guilty of. We can come down harshly on ourselves, or if we don't really want to blame ourselves, we come down very harshly on someone else. In psychology, we actually talk about this happening when we intertwine goodness and worthiness with effort. 
meaning we begin to only see that we have goodness in us if we do things well. We've all felt that pressure to make the grade, to get that raise, to get affirmation or love from someone. It takes effort. And then we quickly turn around and put that into a measuring stick, holding us up against everyone else. All of these are examples of perfectionism. This is what both brothers are guilty of, actually. Both of them, in a way, are longing to impress something, someone. It's a race towards perfectionism between them. The younger brother goes off and lives this extravagant life. He plays at what's known as the perfection of status. Maybe he doesn't have all the money to have the perfection of status, but he tries hard at it. The older brother does everything right, but he works and works and works until the bitterness inside him just grows. I had a professor once in college call herself a recovering perfectionist, and I really resonate with that because perfection is hard. It's a constant struggle to work against because it's embedded in our society and our culture. This story was written thousands of years ago, and here we are talking about it today, and each of you can look at this story and say, I, I remind myself of someone in this story. Both of these brothers look at their actions and find them lacking. And we can understand from the younger brother, he's come down on hard times. He comes home and expects to be chastised. And the older brother expects to be praised. In counseling, I work a lot with people on their ideal. Meaning they have a picture of how they're supposed to be. Their looks, their family, their work, their relationships. There is such thing as an ideal self. I question sometimes for people if their ideal self is attainable. The older brother had an ideal self. The younger brother definitely did as well. Are either of them living up to the expectation? Because the truth is, humanity is not yet ideal. We are imperfect. Dr. Mary Maklachova is a counselor in New York City. She writes often about imperfection. And she says, being imperfect is very human. While striving towards unreachable perfection only takes us further away from what is authentic, true, and real. We all have that feeling of not being blank enough. Insert successful, rich, intelligent, young, beautiful, thin, the list goes on and on. It's so rampant when we privilege productivity, competition, constant progress, and quick fixes to very complex problems. Often when I talk with challenging perfection, I have to talk about John Wesley, who had a whole theory of Christian perfection, which we often call sanctification. It's that final expression of grace. Wesley said that we reach this place when our heart is habitually filled with the love of God and neighbor. In one sermon, Wesley quotes Matthew chapter 5 to describe that sanctification was having a mind of Christ and walking as he walked. However, Christian perfection is not moral flawlessness or truthfully how we define perfection in our culture at all. He meant that we should try to seek out a sense of maturity in our faith. Wesley believed, as I do, that the Father only wanted us to become perfect in one way, our love of this life and the people around it. He wants us to find out and seek perfect love. This love is not free from making mistakes, falling for temptation or failure. It's about being filled with love from the grace of God. The pressure of perfection is so high that there's not always room for what Winnicott called going on being. It's a really lofty term that basically meant just living, existing, being authentic, being true, being real. When you add Wesley's ideas into this, we often do become caught up in the need to succeed that we leave behind what we should be striving for, living this life well. 
embracing our imperfections so we can be good enough. I use this phrase a lot with my clients because most of us are daily living into impossible standards and it slowly destroys us. To give ourselves permission to be a little bit more human, to show up exactly as we are and know that that is enough. And I can say this to people because God showed up first. It's this basic Sunday school lesson. We are good enough because God looked down at us at creation, and in Genesis he called it good. We see later in this story the father's response. He didn't expect perfection out of his sons. He just wanted them to be well. This is why the father throws this huge party when the son returns. He just wanted his son home, safe, back in that support that Winnicott said was so important to developing children, sanctuary. It's easy to see, right? The father in this story is God, and we are the children. At some point in our life, we have all been the older or the younger son. We've come to God with either righteous anger or our tail between our legs. And God welcomes us back no matter how we come to him because he sees us as enough. God is the perfect parent. He doesn't expect perfection in return. God expects us to grow, to make mistakes, and to come back home, to be held in his infinite love as we strive to craft our own. Methodists in Wesley's time often use the phrase onward towards perfection. And since that was in the 17 and 1800s, we're going to change that. <laughs> onward towards love. That's what he's asking. Look back at the Father who celebrates what is lost and then found. He celebrates love onward. Everyone is included in celebration. The servants, the neighbors, bring it all in. I invite you this week to think, where am I demanding perfection out of myself or others instead of love? Can you embrace good enough instead of good? We will all be like the sons at some point, but I challenge each of us to be the father who gives space for mistake and celebrates when we come home. Let us only perfect what God gives to this world freely, his grace and his love. Amen. <clears throat>
you, Catherine. We come to the time of service for our offerings. If you are here in the sanctuary, the offering place is still placed in the back. And if you are online, there is a link um, on Realm for you to give as you are able or as you wish. Um, pray with me. Gracious God, in the light of your extravagant blessings, no matter what the state of the world or our imperfect lives, we offer our gifts and ourselves and know that you transform what we plant into the fruits of love. Amen. Let us stand. by singing Amazing Grace.
today receive this blessing of, for becoming real. Blessed are you who do not despise your realness. It may hurt. You may not recognize yourself in the mirror. But this is what we hoped for, right? To live and love, to be loved. To have our experiences show on our faces and in ourselves. It is the real life of Jesus in us, being made visible as all of our seams show. Friends, now receive this benediction. And now, may the God who loves all creation, especially the broken bits, and Jesus, our companion along this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit, who loves to improvise in surprising ways, go with you, dwell within you, and give you joy. Amen.